Probably Dr. Mazli would like to uh, give his comments. Thank you, Bismillah Rahim. Uh, alaikum and very good afternoon to everybody. So, I mean, just like uh, Wabi Nuriza, I feel very grateful and honoured to sit together with Prof. Tariq, whom I interviewed for my TV program, but he couldn't recall that anyway. <laughs> Last year, I was at the Press TV building. Anyway, uh, you did mention about uh, the Salafism. Yeah, now you remember, good. Um, so, uh, in London, not here. Yeah. So, uh, you did mention the word Salafism just now. It reminds me of my current uh, project on the political Salafism in Egypt. I spent few, I mean, few weeks in Egypt to, to do some interviews with those political Salafis. Now they're having their own political party, uh, which I, 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 and initially I thought is very contradicting to their theological stand, which for them, democracy and partisan uh, is something to be abhorred, and not only that, it's haram. It's prohibited in Islam. So, and furthermore, some of them went even extreme by saying it's shirik, democracy. So it, uh, it triggered my interest to go to Egypt to conduct a few interviews with them, and it was very interesting. After the revolution, after the Egyptian 25th January revolution, you could see the paradigm shift, or I would say the uh, epistemic, uh, I don't know, the, the, yeah, the, the epistemological break of this group when they started to use the jargons that had been used by Prof. Tariq just now. They began to demarcate between the authorities of religion and the authorities of uh, uh, politics. They started talking about general interest, Masale Hamma. And they started talking about Makazi Sharia, which they rejected in the first place. So it's kind of interesting, and it just triggered me to one hadith or one saying of the Prophet Muhammad in, in a famous book, Sahih Muslim. It considered as the second most authentic book in hadith according to uh, Sunni Muslims. There, there's a chapter on uh, Kitabul Fitan. It tells about Prophet Muhammad's prophecies on the signs of the ends of the day, the signs of Qiyamah, Ashrat al And Prophet Muhammad was praising the Romans. He says, I mean, he says in that hadith that before the end of the day, you could see that the Romans will dominate the world. They will be dominating the world because they have five qualities. I think Prophet Muhammad have heard this hadith. Uh, those five qualities are, they are the most patient at time of tribulation. And quality number two, they, they are able to recover quickly from calamity. And number three, they are quick to recover and attack again after defeat. And number four, they are good to poor orphans and weak. And the most interesting thing is the fifth quality with, which he mentioned separated from the four first qualities. He said that they are the best people in curbing the tyrants. If we look at these five qualities, this is what we call as democracy. And when, the Prof, when, when Prophet Muhammad was saying this in what we know in Usul al-Fiqh or in Islamic jurisprudence as ala sabil al-madah, or he was praising it, it means that he was recommending. I mean, he recommended to us, to the Muslims, these five qualities that we should embrace. And Remind mind you that when Prophet Muhammad was saying these qualities, the Europeans were still living in the Dark Ages. None of these qualities do exist during that period, but it does exist now. They do exist now. And Rasulullah was trying to say that those qualities, which democracy, I think the, 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 the initial emergence of democracy is to curb the tyrant is an Islamic principle. It's part of the principle that we should live with it. So, I mean, coming back to the discussion by Dr. Tariq, I think I, I don't want to add more to what he has uh, presented, but I have a few questions in my mind that I would like to ask him, and I hope that he, would, he would reply. I, I, when he talk about uh, the rule of law, 
I think the problem with Muslim scholars, the rejection, I mean, after talking with those Salafis, and with some scholars, and I'm coming from religious background, I found that they are in confusion in separating between what is jurisprudence and what is legislative. They have the tendency to mix both. And what is your comment on that, Prof. Tariq? And number two, talking about the majority rule. I think we often talk about democracy as, a, as the, the choice of majority, but what about the tyranny of majority that we are facing? I mean, Dr. Farouk was mentioning about the tyranny of majority. Because you are Sunni, then you are punishing the Shia. Because you are Shia, you are punishing... And because you are straight, you are punishing the non-straight people. I mean, so those kind of things. And number three, talking about uh, ethics. You just dragged me to, 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 to go further on. You didn't mention about Shura as, as, as the, the, the early model or the early principles of democracy that emerged within uh, Islamic tradition that was mentioned also by John Keane in his book, The Love and Death of Democracy. But again, you did also mention about ethics. But whose ethics are you talking about? If you're talking about Islamic ethics, are we again going to impose that ethics towards the, the, the multicultural society, the multiracial society? Is that what you mean? And my fourth question would be, where do you put Islam in your principles? You know, Islam is the continuous struggle towards perfection in economy, in the politics, in everyday life. So I, I do believe that Islam is the most uh, important principle in Islam that normally being neglected. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Masli. Uh, before I allow Mr. Prof. Tarek to answer, and pro probably Prof. Wu would like to say a few words of comments. Thank you. Um, I know that we are all here to listen to the wisdom of Professor Ramadan. But uh, since my institute has the responsibility of hosting this occasion, it behooves upon me to try to add a few words to the discussion. I was very taken by the distinction that Professor Ramadan drew between principles and models. In other words, there are certain truths which we struggle to achieve. For example, the outstanding one should be justice, equality, and ethical behavior. The question is, what is the best form of social, economic, and political governance in order to arrive at the full realization of these principles? The important point that was made to me, that struck me, was that as the world changed, as circumstances change, the sensible thing to do is to seek fuller realization of the principles is that you have to change your methods of operation. This is, cannot be clearer than in the field of medical science. Ever since we have the scientific theory of diseases, what is it that causes uh, organ behavior and on all those principles are understood, the methods of treatment changes as our knowledge of uh, science improves as well as improvements in technology. So similarly, what, are, what stage are we at such that what is the right model for the age we are in? The theme that Dr. Ramadan has talked about, democracy and human rights, struck me as that for the times we are in, these are two operational mechanisms. Democracy is the right operational mechanism in order to achieve, to abide by the principles of justice, equality, and ethical behavior. So another way of what Dr. Ramadan has drawn the distinction, instead of principles and models, he has also used the term tax 
and context. The text is, doesn't need any reform. It is the context that necessitates that we undertake reform, which is why when in Kuala Lumpur a few days ago you said, the goal is not to reform Islam, the goal is to reform the mindset of some Muslims. Now, within the difference of text and context, I like to add two words, subtext and pretext. Now, what is the subtext of uh, the use of democracy? Basically, the subtext is empowering the individual. Large why? Because the world has changed. People are better educated, they are more traveled, and much better informed than the past. So they are able to make decisions better than, than having a benign dictator to take care of us. In other words, we have reached a stage of development where we are better ruled to achieve the, the, the principles you talk about through the vehicle of uh, uh, empowerment. Here, I think, comes being an economist, I cannot help but to think, what does that mean in translation for Malaysia? We talk, we talk about we have a best democracy. I think we now need best democracy 2.0. And best democracy 2.0, I think one, in, one important ingredient is to pursue the, the, the subtext of empowerment of the individual, which is let's begin by empowering the states. Malaysia started off as a country under threat from communism and under, then later under threat from Indonesia. So that's why we have such a centralized government. If we are so centralized, that the bus system in Penang is designed in Kuala Lumpur. In other words, where you put the bus stop and what routes it go. That is sense, this type of central planning is right for times of emergency that the country was founded. But we have grown. And I think the best democracy 2.0 would require a much greater effort at handing powers back to the state so that they can best respond to conditions in the local areas as they evolved. And I think this is very much consistent with the theme of text and context that Professor Ramadan has identified for us. Thank you. Thank you, Prof.